blog. Hi, I'm Chris White, the CEO of Viable Markets, and I'm doing my first interview at the Rates Evolved Conference in New York City, January 24th. I'm happy to be sitting down with the head of U.S. Fixed Income for NASDAQ, Ted Bragg. We have a lot of great stuff to talk about, um, so let's get into it. Ted, I know that 2018 for NASDAQ, fixed income-wise, was a bit of a transition year. Uh, you were unplugging some things and plugging some new stuff in. Can you talk us through what 2018 was like and how it sets up for 2019 in terms of innovation for you? Absolutely, and, and nice to see you. Thanks for, for, for having us here. Um, you're right, it was a big year for us and, and happy it's over for two reasons. One, because it was so much work. In the beginning of the year, you're writing the business requirements to basically unplug 20-year-old technology and to, to get everyone to the dance at the end of the year so that you go home Friday night and what you used to have traded on isn't going to work. And Sunday night in Tokyo, it's something brand new. It's also, uh, I'm glad that it's over because now we're on something new. And because there's something new, that's the foundation, that's the base, that's what we want to use to build everything else on. When we were looking at how are we going to resurrect NASDAQ fixed income and build something in the fixed base of NASDAQ, it couldn't have been on the old. So we had to get this done. So when you're replacing the old, you're replacing the old e-speed technology and moving on to the new NASDAQ technology? Right, so we're, getting, so we're taking down the, uh, the e-speed matching engine. Okay. We're moving to what NASDAQ would call its uh, financial framework, so NFF. That will be the newest technology coming out of NASDAQ, where NASDAQ had three matching engines. And now as they combine everything together, whether it's for their market tech team to sell out or for their internal desks to use, the 20 exchanges that we run, this is the beginning of that. So now when you want to change something, it's one phone call and not four. It, absolutely. And it's a bit of a, you can, pl you can plug and ask for the uh, a la carte menu as opposed to you have to get, you have to get the whole thing. Great. So now you're, you're sitting at the controls of a car that's a lot more nimble. So what do you see as being some of the opportunities that you're going to drive this platform towards in 2019 and beyond? I would think you would start with what your core product is. Right, so core product, what we bought, NASDAQ bought from Canner was the six on the run treasury market. We're in the dealer to dealer space, rate space, and we know we're in a product that can trade electronically. So that fits for NASDAQ, right? NASDAQ is the exchange. There's no brokers, there's no voice. So it's what other products fit in that model and do we stay in the rate space? Do we cross into the retail space? Because we're in the D to D. Do we go D to C? Is there something to do uh, in credit? So that's part of the, as we're starting to look at size of the market on how we build on what we now have. And what's guiding your thoughts on expansion within the core product set? Like so what are you looking at to determine what you should put in the existing model that you have? Yeah, so core product is treasuries. And, and now we're starting to get some information from the Fed and from the Treasury on they're collecting trace data, what's actually trading. So if you look at the trace data and you look at the ADV of the treasury market, it's a $500 billion market. In the D to D space, it's about $200 uh, billion a day, and D to C is obviously the $300 billion. But the total $500 billion market, 70% of that is the six on the run treasury. So wow. we're in the right spot. Right. Now you've got 30% of the market that is left. If you cut that in half, or 85% of the, of, the, of, the, of the whole market, it's the old issue and the double old issue. So you've got 18 treasuries that represent 85% of the average daily volume. That would be a natural. Let's get two more issues for each on the run to trade in our limit order book. So you're being guided by ba the basic activity in the marketplace, which makes a total sense. Um, there's been a lot of talk about different models for treasuries that aren't actively traded. And now that you can see the data, do you agree that some of these other treasury products that aren't fitting within the 85% that's trading on a regular basis. Does it fit into what you guys have, or are you thinking about different protocols around a space like that? So I've mentioned it's the limit order book, but what other protocols are out there? Well, I don't know if RFQ works in a D2D D space, but I do think some of the auction uh, models and what NASDAQ does really well in the equity world are the closes. So every day in the equity world, we have a 4 o'clock close, and I think it represents I'll make it up uh, somewhere in the 40 to 50 percent of our volume. Maybe I'm a little bit high. And when we look at the Treasury data that we just saw, we also saw that in half hour increments, one of the largest parts of the day for the Treasury market is 2.30 to 3. We know we've got massive passive money uh, that rebalances at 3. And we know we've got an ETF rebalance that takes place at 3. So couldn't we take the NASDAQ limit on close, market on close, have a closing auction, and bring it into the Treasury market? and get banks to want to execute at the close. 
banks that might have had an issue with LIBOR or FX scandals that say, now if we had an auction process and exchange that did it, might want to execute at the close. And the buy side say, hey, just like we do in the equity world, why wouldn't we get executed at the close? Which still is a tool for the banks to say, hey, I can get you executed at the close. Give me your order flow. Let the bank try to trade that first. Let them guarantee the close. If they can't get the close, I'll route it into the exchange. And now you get routing discussions, which is something we haven't had in Pixton come yet, another equity type of term. Maybe at NASDAQ we have some of the technology to do that. Well, isn't it funny how a little bit of data coming out, a little bit of centralized data can start to like, shape your thinking around innovation. I know that there's still some questions as to whether or not the tape should exist, trace tape for treasury should exist. I'm not going to put you in hot water. I'm lobbying, hard. <laughs> I'm lobbying hard for that to happen. Uh, I've talked to the regulators, but uh, uh, we'll see. It's going to take some time. So I know um, outside of building out your core product, uh, NASDAQ's done some pretty interesting things around new products. I know uh, you have a, a new futures type product, the DBO1 future. Can you talk a little bit about why you put that together and what you think it's solving in the marketplace? Sure. So uh, DBO1 stands for dollar value of a basis point. Kind of looking at some fundamental components of the fixed income market. The dollar value of a basis point for each security uh, for one uh, basis point move. And on a U.S. 10-year note, the dollar value of a basis point just so happens to be on our current 10-year note, $820. Um, we thought, if you look at the alternative futures products in the rate space, they don't represent exactly what the cash market uh, has uh, as far as risk and hedging components. The futures contracts that exist in the Chicago complex are a cheapest to deliver right. and a physical settlement. Feels more like a commodity future than it does an actual hedging view. Much more. And right now, the current cheapest to deliver in the 10 year note complex is a seven year note. So if you're long a US Treasury and short the 10 year future, you've got a curve trade on yeah. and you're not weighted one for one. We look at our future as, hey, it's a much better hedging vehicle. You're weighted one for one. There's no cheapest to deliver because we kept it really simple. It settles cash, and it's going to clear OCC. So to get, if 10-year notes, and uh, we've been talking, so I'm not sure where they are, but let's say 10-year notes yield 275. Just like a euro dollar future, subtract from 100. So the contract would trade at 92.25. And to get from, right, 275 from 100, 92.75. <laughs> 70, 92, 20, uh, yeah, 92.25 to 92.24 is one basis point move. That would be 820 bucks. So you already know what your P&L is. You know what you're going to receive at the end of the trade. You kind of know what the repo market is versus where the cash settles. And what we also have is the cash market. So when this contract's going to expire, we point to our cash market at 3 o'clock. We know exactly where it should expire, and we can settle it, and everyone settles up for cash. So we've gotten some really good response around that, and we're going to try to build out a market-making program and get some more uh, ADV and open interest. It's not, we're not looking to get uh, people to move their open interest from Chicago over to this. It's a different, different security. Yeah. So, so how, how do you get a new product, a new product in fixed income to take hold? You, you mentioned your market-making program. So is that really the starting point? You've got to get enough people who are making markets consistently in order for it to sort of make the jump to to, let's say, more actively traded buy side accounts, and then effectively, I think probably the, the last account type that seems to come to innovation are the large asset managers. Like, is that the way that you build the layer cake, I suppose? Yeah, there's so many different uh, components. So first, like you come up with the idea, like is this a good idea? So then you ask people. Right. And, and we asked a lot of different people, and we got some positive response. So then you file and ask permission to the CFTC, and we also go to the Treasury and the Fed and say, hey, we're thinking of doing this. Right. Then you go to the buy side, because we figure there'll be a large consumer and they love it. But the buy side says, until you get ADV, until you get open interest, yeah. we can't trade it. It can't even come into our complex, so it'll come back to us. If you go to a big bank and ask them whether they'd like to trade it or not, it has to get into their FCM. It has to get into their technology. It has to get into their risk systems before they can even look at it. So it's a lot of work. And you've got to go find a market maker. You yeah. got to, somebody's going to take a look at it. And you have to get into market data. Uh, if it's not on the Bloomberg screen or in Thomson Reuters or someone else, no one can see that price. So yes, it's a lot of work. So when we started the interview, you talked about some other fixed income products that you're thinking of taking this NASDAQ te technology and applying it to. So where do, you, where do you see there being opportunity out there? I know there's talk about corporate bonds. Does it go beyond that? Like, what, what are some of the thoughts that you have in terms of uh, using the tech that you have to create protocols and other uh, fixed income products. Right, so we're on the new technology. Now we can be nimble and start to expand. 
from a credit perspective, we also realized there was an ability to have a corporate bond exchange, but predominantly we did it so that the NASDAQ equity exchange could get listings. We could win a listing and have a bond, have a bond listed also. People list bonds because European fund managers require a nationally recognized exchange, have the bond listed before they can buy it. So the SEC says in order to list a bond, you need a trading venue. So we built a trading venue. It's a limit order book. It's kind of simple. But I think. So we're taking the matching engine that you have and just saying different products. Different same, products. Same, same guts. But why not do an auction, a close, a matching session, base it around the create and redemption process in the ETFs, and instead have an event? Hey, it's 3 o'clock, and who would like to trade this basket versus all day long continuous liquidity? So that look for that a little further out. More near term, I need to see what's going to happen, or we need to see what's going to happen in the clearing space. If people start to think about the FICC, DTCC, I want to trade, and more market makers are going to enter into that space, mm -hmm. that opens up repo, that opens up MBS, that opens up some other markets in the rate space, swaps, uh, or do we go to Europe? and look at the European rate space? Or do we go uh, south or to Asia? So that's the, I need to see some catalyst change from a regulatory perspective, which could happen soon, and or some recommendations around that, and we'll base it off of that as well. So right now it's, let's get some more treasury product. Mm -hmm. Once we've got a foothold from a market share, let's see if the futures can get off the ground. Let's do some basis trading, and then enter into another asset class. Sounds like you're gonna have a fun 2019. Thank you, hope so. That concludes our interview, and I'd like to thank Ted Bragg and NASDAQ for being a gold sponsor at Rates Evolved. Thank you, Ted. Nice to see you. Thank you. Appreciate it.